Our topic today is Christ historical and Christ universal. <clears throat> it may sound a bit strange, but when we look at the lives and teachings of great spiritual luminaries, we find their personality and also their teachings have got two dimensions, two different dimensions. The relative and the absolute. The human and the divine. The historical and the universal. When we talk about a great spiritual personality as a historical figure, as an event in history, when we look at his life as just an episode or an event in history, we are perhaps trying to limit his dimension within the confines of time, space, and causation. This is true of all great spiritual personalities. It is said that every great spiritual personality emerges as a response to the demands of his age and his times. It's a natural response to the demands of his age. <clears throat> so naturally, his life, personality, and also teachings may be influenced by the sociological, cultural, anthropological, even linguistic aspects of the place he was born, of the culture to which he was born, of the language which he must have spoken during his younger days, the parables that he uses, the language and style in which he preaches his message, all may have, may bear the influence of his time and the place. See, look at Sri Ramakrishna. If you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, most of the similes, parables, examples have something of a Hindu Vedantic background. Now, in Jesus' parables, you can find the old Hebraic Jewish background of which he was the finest product. So, when I talk about Jesus as a historical event, I'm talking about the cultural, social, anthropological aspects related to his birth and life. And when we, when we talk about this, the universal dimension, we are talking about the eternal spiritual wisdom which he preached to the world, which is eternal, which is universal, which goes far beyond the linguistic, cultural, and anthropological dimensions of the place, the geographical area, and the cultural roots to which he was born. Because it is universal. Truth is universal. Truth is neither new nor old, it, because it is eternal. Truth is not the product of time. It transcends time. It transcends ages. And it transcends the barriers of nationality, culture, and language, and everything. So when we talk about Jesus, the universal, we are talking about the divine aspect of the Jesus which is universal. <clears throat> of course, very often, every prophet has to undergo a serious problem, maybe not during his time, but in later days. Very often, the universal aspect of his message will be interpreted in narrow, dogmatic, cultural, and anthropological terms. This is a tragic fate which every spiritual personality had to undergo, including Jesus, including Shankara, including Buddha, including Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. It happens. So there is a famous statement in, in the language of Voltaire, who was certainly not a conventional believer in God. All prophets spoke the same truth, but, the, but in the hands of men, their teachings got distorted. He was certainly not a believer in 
religion, not a conventional believer. So, in Jesus' teachings also you find this, this dichotomy. So, you know, there's a great statement in Gibbon's fall of the decline and fall of Roman Empire. He says, when Constantine declared Christianity as the national religion of Roman Empire, Jesus' teachings got Romanized instead of Romans getting Christianized. There is an irony in this statement. Now, <clears throat> we are coming to, I'm just coming to the subject straight away. <clears throat> From a Vedantic perspective, you find uh, the highest divine universal message of spirituality in its perfection in Jesus' teachings. In the history of spirituality, you find there is a constant evolution, a process, a movement, a progress from without to within, from gross to subtle, from many to one, and, and from the personal to the impersonal, from the idea of the reality with form towards the idea of the reality without form. From, the, from, uh, from form to formlessness. In Vedantic tradition, very often this is analyzed in terms of dualism, qualified non-dualism, and non-dualism. Dvaita, Vishista, Dvaita, and Advaita. At the dualistic level, everything is different from everything else. God is different from man, and man is different from nature. Man is different from man, and different things in nature are different from everything else. So, five types of differences are <coughs> accepted in dualistic system. I think when Jesus spoke about, I am the wine, and ye are the branches, that's the beginning of the spiritual evolution. You have to remember... You know, Jesus and John the Baptist together brought about a total revolution in the religious thinking of the Hebraic or Judaic tradition. Before John was born, before Jesus was born, the connecting bond between man and God was fear. You had to obey the laws of God or you'll be punished. So the connecting bond was fear. And Jesus, in Jesus teachings, it is love. The love between father and son. So you find uh, till the uh, advent of John the Baptist, who almost spoke in the language of the earlier Hebraic prophets, the sons of vipers, and you know, he, John's language is not very pleasant to hear. Though he meant all good things, but he used a very harsh language, representing, perhaps reminding us of the earlier Hebrew prophets. But Jesus spoke in the language of low compassion and the intimacy of relationship between man and God. <clears throat> Since the earlier prophets, as I said, this covenant agreement, the relationship between man and God, was based on fear of hellfire and expectation of heaven. And that created a lot of dogmatism, rigidity, and mechanical uh, clinging to certain age-old practices among the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priesthood. But when Jesus emerged, he spoke the language of love and compassion. It's a great leap. In fact, it is a great progress, a great stage in the evolution of the idea of God in the Semitic tradition. But still, in, in the early teaching you find this difference. I am the wine and ye are the branches. And later on when he spoke about the kingdom of God being within you, 
you can find a steady progress from dualistic idea to qualified non-dualistic idea. The most primitive or the beginning con of, the, of the earliest concept was dualism, as I said earlier, which is attributed to Madhva in Vedantic tradition. And the intermediary stage was qualified non-dualism, in which God is conceived to be the immanent principle, the indweller in all living beings. In Sanskrit, in Ramanuja's language, it is antaryami. That's why, you know, those who are interested in the Brahadarnika Upanishad, there is a famous verse. Ye prithiviyam dhishtan, prithiviyam antaraha, and ultimately, antaryami amrutaha. This antaryami, the indweller, is the reality. In fact, that is what Jesus must have meant when he said, the kingdom of God is within you. It is not somewhere without, somewhere outside, but within all of us. We have to search and find out. <clears throat> and at another stage, when he spoke about the unity of man and God, when he said, I and my father are one, he was implying non-dualism or Advaita. So you, you find all these three dimensions in the teachings of Jesus. And there is also reconciliation. Because reconciliation between among these three levels is possible only at the level of spiritual experience. Reconciliation is not possible at the philosophical or logical level. But it is possible at the level of uh, spiritual experience. Now, <clears throat> in Jesus' teachings, you find this reconciliation between um, among the dualistic, non-dualistic, and Advaitic tradition. And when we look at Jesus' teachings from this angle, you can find that he was truly or what he preached was truly a universal, spiritual humanism based upon love and compassion and humanity. The idea of renunciation that you find in Bible comes very close to the idea of renunciation in Vedanta, in Vedantic tradition. See, remember, when we talk about Vedanta, you have to understand, by Vedanta we mean the ultimate eternal spiritual values. It is, not the, it is not the name of a system of philosophy belonging to a particular religion or a particular nationality. Vedanta, Veda means knowledge. Anta means conclusion or final word. Not at a philosophical level. At the level of intuitive experience. So the ultimate level of human experience is the intuitive experience of the unity between the seeker and what he is seeking. So I and my father are one, means father is what we are searching or seeking, and I represents the seeker. <clears throat> this is the highest metaphysical wisdom that you find in Jesus' teachings. But at the same time, his teachings also included uh, ideas meant for the spiritual seekers uh, who have just started their spiritual journey. See, those who are mourning, see, those who will be converted, see, those who are seeking will be blessed with the vision of the Lord. God sometimes plays a special uh, game with those devotees whom he wants to grace and whom he wants to bless. What stands in the way of our spiritual progress is our own egoism. Sometimes we need a lot of saving from ourselves, from our reckless, ruthless, hatred, greed, all that are things which should be taken away from us our identity with what we possess in terms of secular prosperity. 
So whenever God finds that your obsession with wealth stands as a stumbling block in your spiritual progress, God turns you into a pauper. A very cruel game God is playing there. But this, is, this happens only if God wants to bless you. If God want, doesn't care for you, then he will let you be as prosperous, as happy, and as egoistic of your wealth and pedigree as possible. But if God has a soft corner for you, then he will take away the obstacle which blocks your progress in spiritual life. There is a famous verse in the devotional classics of Vedanta. Yesya anugraha michami tasya vittam haramiham bandhavaischa viyogena brisham bhavadi dukhidaha tena dukhena samtruptu yadi maam na parityya jet tam prasannam karishyami yad devairapi sudur labham I shall translate and interpret in English. You can find this key if we put this in the words of Jesus. No, nobody will mistake it. See, here in this verse, it says, if God wants to bless you, if God wants to remove the stumbling blocks in your spiritual path, then he removes those, those obstacles, either by taking away those obstacles from your path or taking you away from them. Either he will remove the obstacles or he will remove you from that path. So if you are too much proud of your wealth, he will take away. The, the Sanskrit verse is, I shall steal your wealth if you are too much proud of your wealth. Because I want to bless you. And then if you are too proud of your friends and relatives and your followers, then I shall get you isolated from all of them. Very cruel game God is playing. But this is the highest concept of spiritual liberation, mind you. Man can pray to God for money and wealth and he will give you. But if he really wants to bless you, he won't give you that. It depends upon our own evolution. See, in Bi Bible says, God created man in his own image. It is equally true that man creates God in his own image. It is, I'm not reversing the statement. According to our own spiritual evolution, according to our own spiritual progress, we form a concept of God. If we can look upon God as the one who gives you plenty of wealth and secular prosperity, then God is conceived to be a bestower, a giver of prosperity and wealth. But if you look upon God as the immanent, all-pervading, omnipresent, and transcendental principle, then God opens the door for liberation to you. In the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you find, Sri Ramakrishna puts it in a very humbly, simple language. If children are playing with toys, if they don't care for mother, then mother let him play. You let him not disturb me. But if children throw away their toys and cry, Mother, please come to me, then mother may rush to the child. But the child has to throw away all his toys, everything. Then only mother will listen. If children are playing and happy, then mother won't care. She will be busy in her own work. Similarly, if God really wants to bless you, show his grace, then he will create in you that proper wisdom, the power of discrimination and intelligence, which enables you to throw away your obsession with secular, non-spiritual instruments and tools of enjoyment. And then when we turn to God and God blesses you. And even if you're proud of your pedigree and your friends and relations, then he will get you isolated from them. Bandhavaischa viyogena. You'll be isolated, you'll be turned to bank. A, a, a pauper, you become bankrupt. Still, if you cling to God, then he will bestow upon you the highest liberation, the highest spiritual gift. That's a true message of what Jesus meant 
meant when he said you have to give up everything and follow me then only you will enter the kingdom of heaven kingdom of heaven is not a place where you can enjoy as much as we want it is a kind of intuitive inner spiritual experience that's that's what jesus that that's what that that jesus meant by the word kingdom of heaven it's not a kingdom not a place where you can have plenty to eat and drink and make money nothing of the kind rather you have plenty of wealth spiritual wealth which will make you understand the limitations of material wealth that's what jesus meant so i'm not uh, give i'm planning to give a very very long talk what i wanted to drive home was we have to concentrate on this universal dimension of jesus the spiritual universal eternal dimension of jesus this reality was realized by his followers only after resurrection till that moment they thought he was son of a carpenter they say he was son of god but after all so as we know common people were not willing to accept that he was the son of god but when after during the post resurrection period jesus emerges as the universal christ as the divine as the spiritual ideal that we know him today and for the last 2000 years jesus has inspired taught and led humanity and enabled humanity to walk along the path of peace love and compassion he continues to inspire people not only mystics poets artists writers all spheres of human aspirations got some gift from the teachings of jesus everywhere so i pray to the almighty god that we may all be able to listen to the glad tidings of the angels who sang when his advent took place and i wish you all a very happy christmas and happy prosperous new year thank you all